I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight um, um, about my family and their their history in Tecumseh Township and uh, the experiences that they had coming here. Um, about seven years ago, my mother passed away. And when my mother passed away, I started to receive all of these phone calls from my nieces and my nephews. And Pat, do you have Grandma's recipe for shortbread? Do you have a recipe for peanut butter cookies? So I decided that what I would do is write a cookbook. So I started to compile a cookbook of all Grandma's recipes for the chief or the all of the kids so that they would be able to carry these and have a good memory about her. Once I started doing this, I started adding in little comments as I wrote the cookbook about family. So, you know, my brother's favorite um, birthday cake was angel food cake, and that every time my mother made a homemade angel food cake for Bob, he always threatened to sell the recipe to Gutta Perka for their tires, you know. <laughs> Talk about the fact that my favorite cookie, my favorite recipe, well, you know, birthday cake was banana cake, because uh, bananas were about the only fruit I could eat as a youngster. Um, so it, it was just a, a fun sort of comments that were added. Then I started to add little bits of family history, you know, that our desired love of baking comes down from uh, my great-great-grandfather, uh, William Gilbert, who owned two bakeries on the Isle of Wight in England. Um, you know, so that, that love was there, and my nephews and nieces all bake, all cook, and, and they're excellent cooks. And when I started to add these bits and pieces of information about family, I realized that I knew a great deal about my mother's family, but very little about my father's family. My father had passed away when I was seven years of age. Um, he was an only child. His mother had died when he was four years of age. So, you know, that side of the family, I just knew very little about. My grandfather um, passed away when I was in my 30s, and Grandpa was a very quiet man. You know, he would come over and he'd sit on every Sunday and have dinner and twiddle his thumbs and we'd chew on his watch fob when we were teething, but, you know, <laughs> Grandpa didn't talk much, you know, so very little I knew about Dad's family. So I, my brother and I decided that we needed to do some research into Dad's family. Well, I was very lucky because very quickly I came across a gentleman in New Zealand who was doing what they call a one-name study of black stocks. So I was able to link up with him, and he was in the process of writing a book. So I went down to the Ontario archives and started to gather all of this information about family. Well, I went back, you know, to my grandfather's parents, and I found the names. Uh, John Blackstock, Martha Pringle. Well, who was Martha Pringle? So I then started to look and to see, you know, who Martha Pringle was. And, and, you know, I found the marriage registration for John Blackstock and Martha Pringle, and it listed her parents as George Pringle, Susanna Bell, King Township. So, you know, I started to do a little bit of talking with my brother. He knew a little bit more information than I did about Dad's family, but, you know, not all that much. And I, you know, started doing some more digging. I discovered that they were in the Nobleton area, so I went up to Nobleton into the local history section and found a book called Nobleton Heritage that was put out by the Women's Institute of Nobleton. And it had a wonderful article in there about the Pringles. So very quickly I started to gather a great deal of information about them. Um, at the same time, I was taking these courses through the National Institute of Genealogical Studies. It's attached to U of T to become a professional genealogist. So my love of genealogy just kept growing and growing and growing. And the more I found another relative, the more excited I got. <laughs> <laughs> um, William Pringle, I discovered, was my great, great, great grandfather. And he settled here in Tecumseh. So I started to come up to the Tecumseh Historical Meetings in order to find out more about the area. I didn't spend a lot of time here, and I'll talk more about that as I go on. Now, William Pringle, my great-great-great-grandparents, William Pringle and Jane Gribbins, uh, left Mount Mellick, Queens County, Ireland, <coughs> sometime late in 1817 or early in 1818, and made their way to Prince Edward Island, where they intended to settle. I have a fly around my head here. <laughs> um, 
they, they made a very arduous voyage across the sea because life at that time was not very easy for these people. Um, the immigrant experience must have been rather daunting for them. In the book, Narrative of a Voyage from Dublin to Quebec in North America, James Wilson relates the perils encountered on his voyage from Dublin, Ireland. These would have been similar to those which my family would have experienced as passengers traveling in steerage around the same time frame. James left Dublin on the ship Marion Bell on May 15, 1817. He speaks of the sickness, burials at sea, he um, talks about the strange sea creatures that they would see en route and the horrendous storms that they went through. He offers advice on the kind of provisions needed for the journey in his book. And he states, And first oatmeal and cutlings are much used, molasses also. Potatoes are of the greatest value, nothing more so in my judgment. Salt or hung beef, pork, bacon or hams, are all excellent in their use. Veal when salted and afterwards watered then boiled with beef or bacon will produce a soup very desirable. One family here brought a quantity of fowl and pickle which when watered eat very delicious. Coffee is much preferable to tea, the water being so bad as to render the tea rather insipid and tasteless. Uh, bottled ale is good for drink but in my opinion cider when mixed through water is a much better and cooler drink for the stomach than any other, a constant thirst being common to all on sea. Mm. As to the spices, well, pepper and ginger is mostly used. Flour is essentially necessary. Cake bread or pancakes being very applicable to weak constitution. Eggs are much used, and when well grazed or put in salt pickle for six hours and well packed, will keep fresh a considerable time. This I found by experience. Good port wine is very reviving on sea when used moderately, but spirits is not so very necessary here. I, can, I conceive pickled cabbage to be very useful, such kind of diet only answering while sickness prevails. I therefore recommend it. Biscuit is much used by seamen, and the only way for passengers to take it is pour boiling water on it, and when steeped a few minutes, toast it before the fire, then butter it and it'll eat as pleasant as a loaf of bread, but not otherwise. <laughs> Oat bread, well baked in an oven, will answer well with either tea or coffee. Cheese will be very needful. Split peas for soup. And lastly, vinegar, butter, and potted herrings. To preserve new milk for a voyage, take a large or small jar or jars and clean them remarkably well. And when done, put the milk therein. And after securing it well by corking it closed, Put the jar or jars into a large pot of water and boil them over a good fire. And when done, pack them in a hamper or some other place and it will keep sweet for the whole of the passage. This has been tried by a man of true and credit who went last season to Philadelphia and used the milk there after his arrival, it retaining its natural sweetness. There is a diet much used here, vulgarly called beggar's dish, composed of peeled potatoes and either beef or bacon cut in thin slices and mix through them. It affords a pleasant meal. The soup is much esteemed, <coughs> being seasoned with pepper. And then he goes on, I have a tickle in my throat. <laughs> then he goes on to talk about the fact, David, could you get me a glass of water? Thank you. That um, if you're traveling on the voyage across, <coughs> not to bring dishes that are made of pottery or delft, where as he called it, because of the fact that with the roughness of the voyage, that they broke. Mm -hmm. uh, so he talks you know, about bringing along tin bowls or tin cups so that uh, they wouldn't be breaking. Would you like one of these? Yeah, I can put All of a sudden, I just get these silly pickles in my throat. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. yeah. And he talked about the fact that the best thing to bring along is a pot that is D-shaped and it has a hook on it. Because of the number of people that would be working on an open grate trying to boil or prepare their fires or their, or their dinners, that you could then put a grate up above and they could hang the pot from the um, frame up above. <coughs> and he also talks about the fact that um, when you're traveling, that you have to bring all of your goods in a very sturdy wooden box because of the fact that um, 
you know, to withstand the sea voyage. He also says it's necessary uh, to provide locks because um, otherwise people plunder their, 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 the boxes that they have brought along with them as they probably have not packed enough provisions. It's not like the modern day boat travel that we do today where people go on you know, uh, these boat cruises and they have all of the food provided. When these people went on the voyages across the Atlantic Ocean, they had to bring along all of their provisions. Now, James Wilson arrived off the shore of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia on June 30th, 1817. And it was a journey of about six weeks. So, you know, life for them was, was rather difficult. And I can well imagine the journey that my family had en route to the New World. When William Pringle arrived in PEI around the same time frame, he had a letter of introduction from Sir Alan Johnson to the Lieutenant Governor of Prince Edward Island. And I'm sure that he landed in great anticipation and hope of receiving free land or a land grant. But unfortunately, by 1818, all 67 plots of land on Prince Edward Island were already allocated. There was no land to be had other than to purchase it from a speculator. In April of 1818, my great-great-grandmother Jane died and William was left with three small children on his hand, ranging in age from um, four to you know, twelve to ten years of age. Uh, it must have been a very difficult decision for him to make at that time as to what he was to do with his young family and what he was to do in order to provide land or a home for them. So. He made the decision to travel on to York, Upper Canada, to seek land. While they're on Prince Edward Island, in order to get off Prince Edward Island, get to the mainland, they had to again set out on a sea voyage. So it must have been a very disappointing, very daunting time for, for the family and for the young children to leave PEI, leave their mother behind, and set out. Um, I have yet to be able to find any of my ancestors on a ship's list. The ship's lists that were generated um, back in the early 1800s merely told of the name of the ship, when it set sail, um, where it landed. There was nothing in there about the passengers. There, probably, there was sometimes uh, information about the crew, but my family and a lot of the other families would have been traveling by steerage. They would have been in the bowels of the ship and they would have paid probably very little to come. They wouldn't see daylight unless the weather was good and they could get up on board. So it was, um, it was a rather horrendous time and for them and to be able to make these long journeys. Well, William arrived in York, Upper Canada in September of 1819 and he applied for a land grant. At the time, the process involved in applying for a free land grant was one, submitting a petition to the Lieutenant Governor. If approved, a grant was ordered by the Executive Council and the copy of the order in Council was forwarded to the Receiver General's office where the order was replaced by a fiat authorizing that the grant be made. This then went to the Surveyor General's office. So it, it tended to travel around a lot before it was actually you know, entered into anything. Uh, once the Surveyor General's office got it, the land was located and a location ticket was issued. And the location ticket gave the exact location for the settler so that he would be able to find his property. Uh, and eventually, the land patent was issued. Typically, the advisors of John Graves Simcoe, who had come out with him, on their journey received huge lots of land and they would receive some park lots and some farm lots. Park lots were uh, areas around or within the town of York um, that were sort of preferable lots and then they, they had other lots further out. Well, they were given these large lots of land so that they could then in turn sell it and recoup money that they had uh, put out in, uh, for the cost of their travels over to the New World. Um, United Empire Loyalists were usually given a grant of 100 acres of land. If you were a member of the various military groups and you were a private in the military, you would receive 200 acres. Um, field officers would receive up to 5,000 acres of land. 
And sometimes lots were given on humanitarian reasons or for humanitarian reasons. In William Pringle's petition, it states, to the Honorable Samuel Smith Esquire, Administrator of the Government of our Province of Upper Canada, Executive and Council, and the petition of William Pringle of the Town of York, Farmer, humbly showeth that your petitioner is a native of Queen's County, Ireland, from whence he emigrated to Prince Edward Island, where he buried his wife, leaving three small children on his hands for support in the month of April 1818, and has resided in this province since September last, that the petitioner is desirous on settling some of the waste lands of the Crown, and has but slender means. Humbly prays that your honour will be pleased to order him a grant of 50 acres of land. And it was signed William Pringle, York, April 19, 1820. This was accompanied by a letter of recommendation from Francis Hewson. I certify that I knew bearer William Pringle, late of Queen's County, Ireland, and that he was a loyal and respectable man, preferred of a good prosperity in that county. He was thoroughly commended by Sir Alan Johnson to the Lieutenant Governor of Prince Edward Island, Francis Hewson, York, April 17, 1820. I later found uh, Francis Hewson in the Home District Directory in Barrie in 1837, and he was a Justice of the Peace. There was another uh, document that was attached to this, and I found this one to be very interesting. It was by James Buchanan Esquire, His Britannic Majesty's Consul for the State of New York and New Jersey. I hear with forward to His Majesty's Province of Upper Canada, William Pringle and three children all a British subject, a native of Queen's County, Queen's County, a farmer who has produced satisfactory evidence of good conduct. In testimony whereof I have hereunto affixed by name at the City of New York, the 24th day of April 1819, to their excellencies the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, or other His Majesty's officers in Upper Canada. This document tells me that he probably went from Prince Edward Island to New York, and then probably overland to Upper Canada. Hmm. Now, 50 acres of, uh, of land, Concession 5, Lot 24, in Tecumseh, were granted to William Pringle in April of 1820. This was two years after the survey of the area, after it was relinquished by the natives. And George Lount was a surveyor, and he surveyed the area between 1818 and 1819. He was one of the original settlers in this area. The property was located on the southwest corner of current day Six Line and Highway 27. For William and his three young children, life must have been very difficult. My great-great-grandfather would only be eight at the time the land was granted. The other two children would only be within two years older or two years younger than him. Now certain obligations had to be fulfilled before the land was officially handed over. Within the first year, five acres of land had to be cleared. A dwelling had to be built. They had to clear and maintain the road in front of their property. And there was usually a fee that was levied for all of the paperwork that was done in uh, doing all of the land transactions. William was definitely on the land on April the 20th, 1822, as the surveyor's record of the land indicates that he was there. He had fulfilled his obligations. On June the 13th, 1828, William sold the property to Thomas Hughes for 15 pounds. At the time, he was listed as living in Vaughan Township. As early as 1837, William was listed as being a yeoman farmer on Concession 8, Lot 9 in King Township. He was officially given the 100 acres of land in King Township on the 14th of May, 1840. Now, William is buried, along with his second wife, Mary, in St. John's Anglican Church Cemetery on the Sixth Line in Tecumseh. He is buried beside Thomas Thompson and his wife, Sarah. I believe that William's second wife might have been Mary Thompson. I've yet to find that marriage registration. I've got to go down to the Anglican Church archives and dig through there and see if I can find the record for them. 
The tombstone merely lists his, my, his, her name as Mary. William and Mary had a child named John Pringle, and when John was married on the 10th of February, 1843, to Maria Payne, they were married at the home of Thomas Thompson in Tecumseh by Reverend Featherstone Osler. Thomas Thompson was a witness at the marriage. He must have been family. My great-great-aunt Alice Bell married a Robert Thompson, and when I searched for a land record for Robert, I found a Robert Thompson in Tecumseh who had come to Canada with his widowed mother, three brothers, William, Alexander, and Thomas, as well as a sister. The sister was not named in the records. Hmm. The Pringles and the Thompsons all came from Queen's County, Ireland, and that is clearly stated on both of their tombstones, native of Queen's County, Ireland. These people knew each other. Hmm. Now, John Pringle's grandson, John Newton Pringle, gave an oral history of the Pringle family to the Nobleton Women's Institute. Um, in that, pub it was published in a book called Nobleton Heritage. He talks of his great grandfather, who was William Pringle, teaching school in Richmond Hill. So when when William sold the land in 1828 and was listed as being in Vaughan Township, Richmond Hill was in Vaughan Township. This was probably the time frame during which he was teaching school in um, Richmond Hill. Of the three children who accompanied him to Upper Canada, one was my great-great-grandfather, George Pringle. A biography from History of Toronto and County of York, Volume 2, reads, George Pringle, farmer, Nobleton Post Office, was born in Queens County, Ireland, April 10, 1812. His father, William Pringle, was born in the same place on the 24th of February, 1785, and was by trade a wool comber, the wool in those days being combed by hand. Mr. Pringle Sr. came to Canada at an early day, being about the fifth settler in King Township. He died on April 5, 1873. Our subject's mother was Jane Gribbins previous to her marriage. She was a native of Kings County, Ireland, and died in Prince Edward Island in 1818. George Pringle attended school for a short time in his native town, um, and that's what gave me the date by which they probably had come up. After coming to Canada, he received further instruction at the public school. He commenced farming at an early age, which occupation he continued to follow until recently, when he gave up active life and is now living retired in the village of Nobleton. During the rebellion of 1837, Mr. Pringle enlisted as a volunteer at Lloyd Town, at Lloyd Town. At the time of the Great Battle of Waterloo, Mr. Pringle, then not quite four years of age, distinctly recollects his father taking the newspapers containing an account of the action around to the neighbors. He was married in King Township on the 19th of April, 1835. His wife was Susanna Bell of Queens County, Ireland. They had a family of ten children, three of whom are dead. The names of the survivors are as follows. Jane, Edward, Martha, my great-grandmother, Roland, George, William, and John. Mr. Pringle attends the Methodist Church and is a conservative in politics. And this was in volume 2, page 414. Now, Susanna Bell, wife of George Pringle, was the daughter of Roland and Susan Bell, who took out a lease on 30th of September, 1830, for lot 22, concession 10, in Tecumseh. And we're on the 10th concession. So my great, great, great grandfather settled down on the 10th concession here, lot 22. Roland lived in Tecumseh until 1839 when he moved down into Nobleton, purchasing land beside George and Susanna. And it was interesting, when we did the house tours last year, I was talking to uh, one, of the Chandler, one of the people who owned the Chandler estate, which is just two uh, um, uh, lots over from where Roland had settled. And he talked about the fact that back in that time, that this land must have been very hard for them to farm. It was not good farmland. When they moved down into King Township, they were able to find land that was a little better for farming. Now, my great-great-grandfather, George Pringle, died on 1st of November, 1885, in Alliston, Simcoe County, Ontario. So the family seemed to go back and forth, you know, up and down. 
George's son, George G. Pringle, who was my great-grandmother's brother, married Mary Isabella Bell and ran a general store business in Beaton. Their son, Walter Pringle, married Mabel Maud Ellis, and they lived in Beaton at the start of their marriage and then moved to Meaford, where Mabel's father, William Wilson Ellis, uh, opened a hotel. Two other children came to Upper Canada with William. I was able to find one rather quickly as her daughter married my great-grandfather's brother, Edward Blackstock. On the marriage registration, Edward's wife was listed as Elizabeth Wright, daughter of Joseph Wright and Martha Pringle. There was another Martha Pringle. Um, Numerous secondary pieces of information which I found led me very quickly to believe that Martha was George's sister. I was finding obituaries in newspapers where the Pringles were going up to, to Collingwood for you know, burials up there with the Blackstock family. The Blackstocks were coming down to Nobleton area and the Beaton area for various you know, functions that were happening down here. Um, so that I was able very quickly to find that the Wrights obviously were related. Now Martha and Joseph Wright lived on cons uh, lot, lot 20, Concession 2 in Vaughan Township. That lot is the southwest corner of Bathurst Street and Major Mackenzie. So obviously William, at the time that he was teaching in Richmond Hill, was living probably in and around the same area where Martha was living. Now Martha and her husband Joseph went up to Artemisia Township, Gray County in 1851 and in 1855 Joseph died. Martha was a very uh, strong-willed, independent woman. She certainly would be what they called a woman's liver. On the 1861 census I find uh, the, the Wright household. Their son William is running the farm. Martha has paid $200 in insurance money because she has a school that holds 100 children and a tavern on her property. <gasps> so she was making money the best way she knew how. A number of her children, like their, great, like their grandfather, were teaching school in her school. Um, for the longest time, I wasn't able to find the third child or to officially list Martha as a daughter. When William died in 1872, his will was attached to the land records up in the York County Land Records Office. For 60% of the 60 of wills are found attached to land records of uh, farmers because of the fact that farmers had very little money, but they had a lot of land to transfer. So the wills came attached to the land records, and that's where I was able to find William's will. I had looked at the Ontario archives and was not able to find it. In William's will, he leaves his plot of land or his farm, his hundred acres, on Highway 27 down north of Nobleton to his son John Pringle. My great great grandfather owned the hundred acres which backed onto it on the eighth concession. So he left him 50 pounds. He didn't leave him property, he already had property. But the most wonderful thing that I found in that will was an allotment of five pounds each to his two daughters, Martha Wright and Catherine Beggs. So I now had the third child after you know, several years of looking for the third child. Now Catherine was born 1809 in Queens County, Ireland, and she married a gentleman by the name of William Beggs. William Beggs was a fairly affluent farmer in Whitby East. Um, her children married well. Three of her sons moved to the United States. Uh, two set up a vast tannery business in Woolburn, Massachusetts. And it was interesting because when I found one of them on the 1901 census, he had a home um, that was 10 rooms in size. He had, there was an elevator in the home. There were several servants within the home. He was well off. You know, my family were farmers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another, one of her daughters married uh, a William Bambridge who was a carriage maker in Oshawa. So this family was well connected. 
It was also interesting when I took a look at Martha, Martha Pringle Wright's family because Martha's first daughter was born in Darlington. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, why would you be born in Darlington? They had been in Tecumseh, they had been in Vaughan, they were in Artemisia Gray. Why was this child born in Darlington? Well, obviously, when Martha came term for her to have her first child, she went to stay with her sister Catherine. Um, it's interesting when I take a look, you know, through the newspapers and I do the reading of I've gone through several newspapers up in the Collingwood area and also down in the Bolton newspapers because they're just full of information about the family, you know, coming back and forth and visiting with one another. And, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, this part of my family was lost to me for so long. Now the family, like their earliest ancestor in this area, moved around. William's grandchildren who were here in Ontario, they were also in British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Michigan, North Dakota, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Florida. The family moved. They didn't stay in one spot, and obviously they must have got that wanderlust from William because he certainly took a long and arduous trip to get here. I have made contact with so many of them, and it absolutely amazes me that you're able to find family who live so far away. And I'm in touch with the family down in the States. Um, one of my um, relatives up here in Newmarket area, um, had, a woman had her birthday, her 90th birthday party, in the community hall just down here in Bondhead. Uh, just last year. So, you know, it's, it's very intriguing, you know, to be able to make those contacts and to be able to share information. Now, the family from its earliest beginnings has contacts in many families in and around Tecumseh and King Townships. Uh, uh, Agar, Adair, Archibald, Atkinson, Banting, Bell, Breeden, Conroy, Cowper, Ellis, Gunn, Hill, Hollingshead, Cake, McTaggart, Mitchell, Moore, Robb, Sampson, Snyder, Sutherland, and Weller, just to name a few. <laughs> Although William Pringle moved out of this area, I feel a connection with this area. When I come up, I quite often stop into the cemetery on the sixth line and visit my great-great-grandfather's grave. My sister was recently buried in the United Church Cemetery over here in Bondhead. My nephew, who was the great, 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 great grandson of William Pringle, lives one concession north of where his, his great, 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 great grandfather originally settled in Bondhead. So, um, you know, I, I do feel the connection here. But I also must say that when I first came up to this meeting, I so enjoyed the people that I met here and uh, I just love to come up to the meeting and to be able to share and to hear all of the stories around. So thank you for your time.